Good evening. We are delighted to welcome the Irish Ambassador, His Excellency Daniel Mulhall, and his wife Greta. We're also very privileged to have as our guest of honour this evening, Siobhan O'Casey. Your Excellency, you hail originally from Waterford and completed your degree and postgraduate academic studies at the University College in Cork. Since the late 1970s, you had a very distinguished diplomatic career, holding positions in the Department of Foreign Affairs for Ireland, including posts as Irish Ambassador to Malaysia, Vietnam, Thailand, Berlin, and since September last year, London. <coughs> we understand you have a secret enthusiasm for Irish drama, and the title of your lecture for this evening, O'Casey and the Drama of History, reflects your passion. So we will let you begin. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that uh, very uh, kind and short. Uh, I was sort of gathering my thoughts uh, gradually when uh, suddenly it was all over and I was standing up. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's fine. I've been around for a while, so I'm, I'm, I'm used to long introductions and short ones. And on the whole, I think I prefer uh, short ones, although... Long introductions can have their can have their advantages also. Um, well, thank you very much, first of all, for the invitation, and it's wonderful to be here in the presence of Shimon Casey. I hesitate to talk about your father in your presence because I'm no expert at all, really, on on Shimon Casey, except that I've read all the plays and I reread them over the weekend. And um, and actually, um, this um, lecture um, comes from um, my time in Germany when um, there's a wonderful man uh, called Professor Hermann Real. And if you haven't met him, you should meet him. He's the leading scholar in the world on Swift. And uh, he's, he runs a centre called the Ehrenpreis Prize Centre for Swift Studies at the University of Munster. And I, of course, being a Munster man myself, I was attracted by the idea of uh, going to the University of Munster. So I did, and I, I made a joke about, you know, having studied where Finbar taught at Munster Learn, and now I was going to try and teach Munster uh, something. But anyway, um, this wonderful man... Uh, Professor Real um, invited me to um, visit the university, and, I, and I, I brought along a Yeats exhibition, and I opened the exhibition, and then not, uh, and I gave a talk on Yeats. And not content with that, uh, he, the following year, said, "Well, you must come and give three lectures at the university." And uh, I said, well, "Okay, fine, if you like. Why not?" And um, he, I thought, "Well, what am I going to do?" So I, the three lectures I gave were um, one on Yeats and Yeats in Irish history. Um, uh, James Joyce's Ireland, or um, James Joyce and 20th century Ireland, or James Joyce's portrait of 20th century Ireland. And then the third lecture I gave was um, Sean O'Casey's History Plays. And um, I, I wrote the first two um, of these lectures uh, fully, and, and I, I have the, the, you know, the full text, but I didn't have time to write the third one, so I had to um, deliver it with a few notes. So I've revisited those notes uh, in the last few weeks when I heard I was coming here. And uh, I, um, even on my holidays there over Christmas, I, was, I had my, my, my very old copy of O'Casey's <laughs> Plays. Uh, it was actually, it's, it's, it's sold for a shilling. I don't know where it's sold for a shilling. I didn't think I ever bought a book that was sold for a shilling. But anyway, um, it's, um, it, was, it, uh, it originally belonged to somebody called uh, McCready and was bought in 1957. So that's, that shows you how, how old this book. I think I bought this while I was a student. So I, I, um, I do have a long... Standing, standing uh, interest in, in O'Casey's work, but I've never really um, written much about it. But anyway, I, I decided that, um, why did I want to talk about O'Casey's history plays? Because I had this idea that, that the three plays, uh, The Shadow of a Gunman, Juno and the Paycock, and The Plough and the Stars, are kind of like an Irish equivalent of Shakespeare's history plays. And of course, if you read the three plays, you will see quite a few references to O'Casey, and indeed, sorry, to Shakespeare in the plays. And indeed, at one point, there's a quotation from Richard III, which is one of, um, of uh, Shakespeare's history plays. So I had this fanciful idea that, that these could be the equivalent of, of uh, Shakespeare's history plays, but dealing with a period of Irish history much shorter, of course, than the period that the history plays uh, deal with. So um, I... I'm not a professional historian, I'm not a professional academic at all, but I probably, 
if I hadn't ended up in this job, I probably would have ended up somehow in academia, I suppose. Um, in fact, um, I was once described by Boris Johnson in The Spectator as an amateur historian. Now, I'm not sure whether that was meant to be a compliment or an insult. I'm not quite sure. But anyway, um, I, was, I was mentioned in that way. And um, um, so I suppose if the Mayor of London regards you as an amateur historian, that's probably something to, uh, to talk about. But that was long before he was Mayor of London. That was when I was a, a, a youngish diplomat in, in uh, Brussels, and Boris Johnson was the uh, correspondent for the Telegraph there. But I, um, I, what I really want to, to talk about tonight is, is the whole idea of, of the drama of history. And I've always been fascinated really by the, um, by the intersection between history and literature. My thesis was on Yeats and George Russell essentially and um, I've always I've written quite a bit about Yeats and Joyce and it's always been in that kind of area of, of what is the, the intersection between literature and uh, history. And probably uh, no other Irish writer of the 20th century captures that overlap in the way that uh, Sean O'Casey in the three great plays does. And what I want you to do is, I want you to, first of all I want to say that, that, that I mean, history is, is not normally a drama. History is kind of more of a, of a long uh, extended um, prose work. And it's good that most of the time history is dull because um, um, when people are involved in the drama of history, it's normally not a good thing for those who uh, live through it. So uh, the first decade of the 20th century, the world was a fairly dull place, but people were pretty happy, I suppose, overall, at least in, in, in European and uh, North American uh, societies. And there was a kind of a you know, golden era and I mean, Belle Epoque and all of that. The second... Um, uh, decade of the 20th century was a very dramatic decade, but frankly, it's not one you'd want to have lived through because a lot of people didn't didn't, didn't manage it because of the, the terrible things that happened during that uh, decade, and including in Ireland, of course, where we, you know, I, I always think that, we, you know, we, we forget that, that the Irish Revolution occurred in an international context, which was a context of, of, of um, global, um, or not global war, but certainly war on a grand scale, on a scale never before seen in human history. Um, so we shouldn't forget the, the fact that the Irish Revolution occurred in that broader uh, European context. But I would ask you to cast your mind back to the year 1904. Now that was a year when, it was the year of the Russo-Japanese War. It was also the year when Roger Casement won international renown by exposing Belgian atrocities in, in the Congo. And why do I ask you to turn the clock back to 1904, because that was the last year when the three great writers of Ireland's 20th century walked the streets of Dublin at the same time, because W.B. Yeats was frequently in Ireland during 1904 because he was preparing for the launch of the Abbey Theatre in December of that year. James Joyce lived in Ireland throughout 1904 until the 9th of October when he left. Uh, and only to come back on two subsequent occasions uh, to Ireland. And Sean O'Casey, of course, lived in Ireland throughout that year and until the mid-twenties when he moved to London. So I suppose what this encourages us, us to do is to sort of compare and contrast uh, the three Irish writers who walked the streets of Dublin um, during that year and might easily have met um, there's no record that they, they did, although um, who knows, they may well have, have um, sat in the same pub or, or met on a street. Um, but, so they had contrasting backgrounds and, and contrasting attitudes, I would say, towards uh, the Ireland of their time. I mean, Joyce always regarded it with a sort of wariness of the young estate who didn't really want to get entangled in... Um, Irish as wanted to fly the nets of nationality, religion and, and language in order to, to um, forge in the smithy of my soul but outside of Ireland the, the uh, uncreated conscience of my race as he put it in a portrait of the artist as a young man. 
And WB Yeats was constantly um, back and forth. Um, and I think that the difference between the Joyce and Yeats, Joyce obviously kept a distance from Irish events, um, was fascinated by them, by the way, but, but, but from a distance and, and was wary of, of entanglement. Yeats was a sort of a Olympian kind of figure who kind of could, could kind of march um, above the drama of history and, and write occasional lyric masterpieces to, to sort of comment. But most of his writing was, was, had other preoccupations, uh, although an impressive amount of it dealt with the, uh, the drama of Irish history during that uh, decade between 1913 and 1922. So the point I want to make is that in 1904, when the three writers were living in Dublin at the same time, Ireland was a relatively quiet place, uh, even if there were new nationalist movements that were emerging, and they were, but as yet, these national movements posed no threat whatsoever to the ascendancy of the Irish party, which had dominated Irish politics for um, 40 years at that stage, and was dominated for another um, 12 years. Um, however, if you turn the clock forward to 1914, whose centenary we currently uh, are marking, you find a totally changed Ireland, because you have four armed militias on the go. You have the Ulster Volunteers, the National Volunteers, the Irish Volunteers, and the Irish Citizen Army. So a small country with what, at that time, maybe five million people, with um, four armed militias um, doing the rounds, marching up and down, and, and threatening all kinds of things. Um, so it was a far from tranquil country at that stage. And indeed, in, in 1914, um, the biggest threat to European peace was not in Bosnia, but rather, or, or Serbia, but rather in Ireland, where uh, civil war appeared to be, or there was some kind of um, you know, uh, possibility of a, of, of a serious conflict breaking out um, uh, about Irish home rule. So, in so 1914, Ireland was already a, a fairly turbulent place, but nothing like it became. In the following 10 years, you had Ireland moving from, in 1914, being a, a discontented part of the British Empire, moving towards home rule. Uh, in 1922, Ireland becomes uh, an independent country, at least uh, um, the um, southern part of Ireland becomes an independent country uh, and is already um, involved in a, a rather um, a dreadful uh, civil war. So that decade, which we're currently commemorating, is a, was a really dramatic decade in Irish history. And so the drama of history, if you like, visited Ireland during the years between 1913 and 1922. And I believe that in Sean O'Casey, the drama of history, the drama of Irish history, found its dramatist. And this is, I think, an important thing to uh, to recognise um, as part of this this. Um, um, paper, and that's that's one of my main points about O'Casey is that he, he he became the dramatist of the Irish Revolution, and I want to explain a little bit about what I mean by that and and, and what implications it has. So his achievement was, I mean, if you if you think about that decade, I mean, I'm very conscious of the fact that the decade we are now commemorating was a decade of political excitement, but it was also a decade of of literary excitement in the sense that. He has published three major collections plus an autobiography. Joyce published all of his great work, uh, Dubliners in 1914, Portrait of the Artist in 1916, and Ulysses in 1921. So, and then John O'Casey didn't publish his great works during the decade, but they were all set during the decade. So in a sense, it was an extension of that decade uh, when O'Casey's uh, works were uh, published and performed. So his achievement was very considerable, and his three great plays, it seems to me, they, can't, they have to be viewed, along with the play by the Western world, as the indispensable classics of 20th century Irish drama, and they are still played in Ireland to, to great enthusiasm. Now, although the plays are normally uh, referred to as his Dublin plays, as I said earlier, I tend to uh, think of them as his history plays. Um, and this is because they deal with the three formative events of Irish history, the Easter Rising, the War of Independence, and, and the Irish Civil War. And, and there, there are no three events in 20th century Irish history more important than those three events. 
and O'Casey's plays. I mean, it's not like, I mean, okay, you could say that WB Yeats, um, um, the uh, Easter 1916 is about the Easter Rising, um, 1919, I suppose, is about the War of Independence, and Meditation in the Time of Civil War is about the Civil War. But there was just part of a, a, a much more extensive Yeatsian uh, output in those years. But here you have three plays that are absolutely you know, focused on those three great events in Irish history. So O'Casey's three plays cannot be divorced, in my view, from the real events they depict. As his biographer has put it, Irish history underpinned O'Casey's dramaturgy. But, of course, the important thing is that to O'Casey and to Yeats, these events were not history. They were current affairs. They were, they were things, they were events that they, ex uh, 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 that they experienced. And, um, but I think the difference between O'Casey and Yeats and Joyce was that O'Casey was a passionate observer of these events with a personal and political conviction with regard to the events he was dramatizing. This, I think, distinguishes him from Joyce and even from Yeats, both of whom tended to cast a colder eye on contemporary political developments. Yeats, okay, sorry, O'Casey was more actively, far more actively engaged with the main currents of nationalist Ireland during these years than either Yeats or Joyce. By the time 1916 came around, Yeats was more or less a disillusioned uh, romantic nationalist who had sort of lost his, his, his enthusiasm, and it was rekindled by the Easter Rising and then sort of disillusionment set in again in the 1920s. Um, but O'Casey lived in Ireland throughout these years, whereas Joyce was in exile throughout this period and Yeats was a perennial migrant between Britain and Ireland. The other point I would make is that while Yeats was a writer who became involved in various national movements during the 1890s, and these movements did influence his writing, I think in the case of O'Casey, political involvement or activism preceded and fired his creative writing. His life was shaped, it seems to me, by his engagement in the various movements that provided inspiration for Ireland's independence struggle, the Gaelic League, the Irish Republican Brotherhood, the Gaelic Athletic Association, and the Irish Transport and General Workers' Union. I mean, you know, if you had to, to pick out the great movements of early 20th century Ireland, those were the ones. The only one he wasn't involved in, and this is an important point, was the Irish Volunteers. He had a, a, had a, a a, a, a negative and um, hostile appreciation of the volunteers, and that really, in a way, also shaped his work. So, but the other four movements, um, you know, the Gaelic League, devoted to, to uh, reviving the Irish language, the Irish Republican Brotherhood, secret society uh, devoted to creating an Irish uh, Republic, which eventually uh, orchestrated the Easter Rising of 1916, and the Gaelic Athletic Association, still today, one of the pillars of Irish national identity, and an extraordinary uh, movement whose achievements, I think, should not be underrated. So in the early years of the 20th century, O'Casey threw himself into learning the Irish language, and he became a dedicated member of, of the Gaelic League. Let me just tell you that uh, O'Casey was, in a way, in the, at the beginning of the 20th century, in a way he was a kind of a, he was a product of that, of, of the zeitgeist of that time in Ireland, this kind of this sort of Irish Ireland identity, which O'Casey okay, had, I think, along with the people who were involved in the uh, Easter Rising and in the um, subsequent stages of the Irish Revolution. So, in his early writings, O'Casey, okay, just like the others, like D. P. Moran and William Rooney and and, and Yeats in the 1890s. He made extravagant claims about Ireland's future. And I'll just give you one quote that will give you an idea of what I'm talking about. He said at one stage, Ireland never will be a slave to commercialism. Her glens and valleys will never be furnace burned. In her language, national and dramatic revival, she has turned her back on mammon. <laughs> right. Now, those of you who know Irish history will probably be able to detect in that the same strain 
that 40 years later, 30 years later, it comes out in De Valera's famous speech on St. Patrick's Day in 1943, uh, which he saw Ireland as the home of a people who valued material wealth only as a basis of right living, who were satisfied with frugal comfort. Right? <laughs> this is O'Casey, whatever it is, I, um, that period, um, it's 1913. And De Valera, 30 years later, the same ideas. And if you read through early 20th century Irish writers into intellectuals, they all had the same be in their bonnet. It was, Ireland was a special place. It was a, I mean, Yeats, I can quote from one of his, one of his things in the 1890s. Um, what is it? Ireland is one of the seven fountains in the garden of the world's imagination. You know? They, they, they were, but they were, again, they were products of their time because this was a, this was something you could probably find in, in various parts of Europe as well. Extravagant claims for the uniqueness of uh, individual national identities. So, at this point, I think, O'Casey considered that his trade union convictions and his Gaelic aspirations could be combined and reconciled. And the rest of his life in Ireland was, I suppose, um, a, a sort of a, a, a sad discovery that, that, that reconciliation between the Gaelic and, and the labour strands of his identity uh, could not be achieved as, as, as readily as he might have imagined in the, early, in, the early, in the first decade or so of the 20th century. So his, his passion for, for the Irish language drew him into political and, and uh, you know, revolutionary activity. And he joined the Irish Republican Brotherhood. Uh, but however, I think his, his fundamental involvement that shaped his work and his life was his involvement in the, in the Irish labour movement. And I actually would see the three plays as a labour history of the Irish Revolution. That, that, that's how I would depict them. So he was involved in the lockout of 1913. But perhaps the defining moment in O'Casey's life, I've already referred to this obliquely, was when in 1914 he resigned from the citizen army on account of a dispute. He had a dispute, and the dispute was essentially about his disdain for the Irish volunteers. So he left the Irish citizen army because the citizen army brought Constance Markovic um, onto the board of the Citizen Army, and O'Casey thought that this was fundamentally a mistake. And he didn't, of course, Markovic was the one later mythologized by W.B. Yeats and Cool Park and Bally Lee, you know, the, the, the two girls, one a gazelle and all that. Um, but for O'Casey, it wasn't that she was an Anglo Irish princess that, that uh, bothered him, it was the fact that she uh, was coming into the citizen army from the Irish volunteers and therefore he considered her as somebody who didn't belong in the Irish citizen army because his view was that, that Irish workers should not be seduced into joining the volunteers because he regarded the Irish volunteers as a bourgeois movement and he said that because that movement will always oppose national aspirations that may be opposite to their monetary and commercial interests. So he saw the Irish volunteers as essentially full of people who had taken uh, a position against the workers in the Dublin lockout of 1913. So in the aftermath of the Easter Rising, which in case he didn't take part in, although he had been a founding member of the uh, Citizen Army, he'd left the Citizen Army by the time uh, the Rising broke out. He published a pamphlet in 1917 on Thomas Ashe, and O'Casey regarded Ashe as, quote, a true Republican and a firm and convinced advocate of the rights of labour. So it was what appealed to him about Ashe was that Ashe combined the republicanism and the labour identity. O'Casey, I think, began to challenge the conventional view of the Easter Rising at an early date. In his history of the Irish Citizen Army, published in 1919, he was critical of James Connolly for making, quote, the high creed of Irish nationalism his daily rosary, while going silent on, quote, the higher creed of international humanity, end quote. Thus, he said, Ireland had lost, uh, Irish labour had lost a leader. Now, at this stage, O'Casey had not given up on the Sinn Féin movement because he believed that, quote, labour had tinged the Sinn Féin movement with a brighter colour, end quote, and thus strengthened it. He felt that the Irish labour movement was fundamentally democratic 
but far from being national. And he urged Irish Labour leaders to become Irish if they wished to win the confidence and support of the Irish working class. So at a very early stage, he realised that the tide of history was moving in the direction of an Irish national consciousness that would, that would sweep all before it. And he felt that the Labour movement needed to, um, which he was a devoted member of, needed to become uh, an integral part of that, and therefore that Irish Labour leaders needed to become more thoroughly Irish, because he felt that the Irish Labour movement was a little bit like a pale reflection of the English trade union movement. Now, I think the shadow of a gunman represents a further evolution of O'Casey's reflections on, Irish, on Ireland's revolution. It's set during the War of Independence. And as with the other two great plays, it takes place in a tenement house in one of the poorer quarters of Dublin. The play's characters are the inhabitants of the tenement. They include Seamus Shields and Donald Daverin. Now, Shields and Daverin seem to me to be two kind of figures that represent two particular strands in early 20th century Irish life. Daverin is the romantic poet, who could he almost be Yeats, I think. He's sort of this kind of uh, dreamy romantic poet. And his views on, on poetry read very much like those of Yeats. I quote, to the poet, the end of life is the life that he creates for himself, which is a great, is a great quote, and that could easily have been said by W. B. Yeats. And then Seamus represents a more kind of cynical, um, you know, um, a, a sort of a cynical brand of nationalism. He's a very devout Catholic, and he believes that the country has gone mad. As he puts it, quote, petrol is their holy water, their mass is a burning building, their creed is, I believe, uh, I believe in the gun almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And by the way, that, that parody, uh, is also also comes up in Ulysses with um, I, I believe in Rod the Scourger, uh, so you know this is a parody of the of, of the creed. Um, so Seamus believes in the freedom of Ireland, but he draws a line when he hears quote the gunmen blown about dying for the people when it's the people that are dying for the gunmen end quote. So he has this kind of kind of you know cynical uh, attitude towards the whole uh, revolutionary struggle. As in all of O'Casey's plays. The dialogue between the characters is lively. And when, when I was in Munster, when I ran out of text after I'd used up my notes, I just, I just went through the play and read it. And it's fantastic. It's, I mean, the plays are hilarious. The, you know, the language in them reminds me of Ulysses, by the way. If you think, and I'll just give you an example here now, right? Um, the dialogue reminds me of the dialogue in, in Joyce's Ulysses. For example, Mr. Henderson. Sorry, Mrs. Henderson describes Mr. Gallagher as, quote, as decent and honest a man, as decent and honest and quiet a man as you'd meet in a day's walk. And that reminds me of the quote from Ulysses, the decentest little man that ever wore a hat, right? So, you know, you have the same kind of Dublin, irreverent Dublin um, dialogue. Now, I'm not from Dublin, so I only heard this, uh, you know, by, well, my, actually, my grandfather was from Dublin, and he was a little bit like that as well, so I think I probably have heard a little bit of this stuff. But that's, that, that's the Dublin... Um, um, approach to life and, uh, and flair for language that, that makes you listen to such a great book is also to be found throughout these plays, actually. Anyway, in the, in the Shadow of a Gunman, you've all read it, but, but um, it's, you know, the Davron and Seamus, when they, dis they discover a bag of guns in their apartment, and they accept the offer of a neighbour, Minnie, to keep the guns in her own apartment, where it is supposed that British soldiers will not conduct a search. The soldiers do conduct a search, and Minnie is arrested and eventually killed. So it's a play where um, um, Daverin plays up being a gunman, because he says, uh, what's the harm in being a shadow of a gunman, you know, and getting the reputation of being a gunman, and therefore attracting this uh, young, younger woman, Minnie, to him. And Minnie, of course, pays the penalty. She, she dies as a result of her innocent delusions, uh, while the cynical Seamus and the weak-willed dreamer, Daverin, both come through. So it's a kind of a, it's a, kind of a, there's a certain kind of commentary there, I think, on the whole kind of ethos of revolution. Now, I regard Juno and the Paycock as O'Casey's greatest achievement. Set in the Civil War, it is strong in terms of plot, character, and language. And for me, Juno Boyle is O'Casey's most powerfully drawn and most sympathetic character. And of course, it's interesting that a lot of the women characters in O'Casey are actually extremely well drawn and, and um, sympathetic characters, where the men, a lot of the men tend to be, I'm afraid, guys, ne'er-do-wells, um, or people with 
suffering from various forms of delusion and, uh, and usually connected with, uh, with, with a bravado and with uh, having had a few too many drinks. Um, so, I mean, I just love uh, some of the lines. In fact, last year I was invited to the English Theatre in Berlin uh, to do some readings from Irish literature, and I, and I read some of the uh, some of the quotes from 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 Juno the Peacock, and the German audience just loved it, and it's it's fantastic. Um, um, it's so poetic, really. The you know the whole, I mean, the language is is poetic um, while at the same time being down to earth and 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 humorous. I mean, for example, I love the line where where um, where Juno Boyle the heroine of the play and, and where her daughter says there's no God, mom, there's no God because he wouldn't do these things to us if there was a God and she says these things have nothing to do with the world, or, or with the will of God uh, what can God do again, the stupidity of men and then this great line take away our hearts of stone and give us hearts of flesh take away this murder and hate and give us thine own eternal love it's fantastic and, and, and that's why I really, I really think that Juno is the, the, you know, the greatest Irish play of the 20th century so anyway Juno steps up it seems to me the critique of, of, of revolutionary Ireland. Uh, it, it's dismissive of the cult of patriotic death. I mean, it, it's extraordinary that, you know, that within years, really, of the, the events of the Easter Rising and, and its uh, aftermath, the War of Independence, that, you, you know, Casey is sort of, is already, you know, kind of um, just questioning the whole idea of, of, of sacrifice um, of the kind that was even I remember in 1966 when we were marking the 50th anniversary of the Easter Rising, that kind of, you know, the cult of sort of, of, of you know, the sacrificial leaders of the Rising was really very strong and we were, you know, we were sort of, um, I mean, they were the names that chilled our, uh, that, 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 that stilled our childish play, to, uh, to quote Yates in a different context. But um, Juno says, quote, it's nearly time we had a little less respect for the dead and a little more regard for the living. And that was the sort of, that's the sort of essential critique that runs through uh, Juno. And he, ex he extracts great comic relief from the inebriated, fraudulent bravado of Captain Boyle and Joxer. Um, Captain Boyle says, I've done my bit in Easter week. And it's quite clear from, from the rest of the play that he was probably nowhere near anything that involved any kind of sacrifice uh, during Easter week. But he has this kind of, you know, this kind of um, pumped up sort of um, um, you know, uh, bravado when it comes to, to the, uh, the memories of Easter week. And even, of course, you know, the staunch trade unionist, Jerry Devine, comes out poorly when he abandons Mary when he discovers she's pregnant. And then, of course, you have Bentham, who's this teacher and a theosophist. And by the way, uh, theosophy was a, was, a, was a very popular New Age religion in Ireland in the, in the first 20 years of the um, 20th century. And, uh, and Bentham also abandons uh, Mary, um, having fathered her child, he disappears when, when the money that's supposed to uh, come to, um, to, to um, uh, the Boyle family um, turns out not to be um, um, on the way at all. It's been a, it's been a sort of a, a sad delusion that, that there's a lot of money coming from a, from a cousin of, of Captain Boyle. Well, by the way, he's not a captain. He simply, um, I think, had one or two <laughs> short trips on a merchant. Um, on a merchant vessel, but manages to call himself um, um, the um, managed to call himself uh, captain throughout the rest of his life. Um, and of course, I mean, the, I mean, I mean, the main theosophist, of course, uh, in early 20th century Ireland was George Russell, another great figure, and I think um, a supporter of Sean O'Casey's, who published some of his some of his work in the 1920s in the Irish Statesman and indeed in the Irish Homestead as well, where Joyce uh, published his first. Um, um, uh, short stories, but Joyce, of course, being Joyce, sort of, I think, referred to it as the pig's paper, so, uh, because it was a paper that was designed to, to um, uh, appeal to uh, people in rural Ireland who were members of, of rural cooperatives. Anyway, the final point I want to make is about the plough and the stars. This is where O'Casey gets around to grappling with the seminal event in modern Irish history, at the Easter Rising of 1916. As one of O'Casey's O'Casey's biographers puts it, the Rising shaped his imagination. It helped to make him into a great playwright. Although Casey was one of the founders of the uh, Citizen Army, he didn't fight in 1916. Uh, this play is set in November 1915 and during Easter week. And someone else has said um, that by missing out on direct involvement in the Rising, quote, O'Casey failed in the world of action and turned aside to justify himself in the world of art, end quote. I'm not sure, but it's an interesting quote, at least from, a, from an American scholar 
who wrote The Imagination of an Insurrection in the 1970s, 60s. So The Plough of the Stars is the most politically strident of O'Casey's history plays. This is because it was the last of the plays to be written, and by the time of its composition, O'Casey had become a firm critic of the Irish Revolution. He had fallen out with those who had brought this independent Ireland into being. He wrote, quote, they have turned Ireland into a huge crystal ball in which they see visions and over which they dream dreams. A passionate Irish speaker himself, in the 1920s, he was sharply attacking the idea of compulsory Irish in schools, arguing that the attachment of, uh, to the Irish language by political leaders was, quote, a fancy fraud and a gigantic sham, end quote. As with O'Casey's earlier plays, the occupants of the tenement are the main characters and um, um, the play has many elements characteristic of um, O'Casey's work. Vivid characters, animated dialogue and the homespun philosopher in Fluter Good who um, after a few drinks observes, I think we ought to have as great a regard for religion as we can. So as to keep it out of as many things as possible. End quote. So that's 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 Fluter, his kind of homespun philosophy of the kind you get in in Ulysses as well, and throughout um, uh, O'Casey's plays, it seems to me. Um, uh, the Covey, who's a sort of a dedicated socialist, expresses something of O'Casey's own beliefs, I would imagine, when he insists that he does not want the workers' flag, the plough and the stars, to be associated with the national struggle because, quote, it's a labour flag and was never meant for politics. It's a flag that should only be used when we're building the barricades to fight for a workers' republic, end quote. So whereas Yeats mulls over the rising's heroic dimension, the terrible beauty that changed everything, O'Casey's take on events in 1916 is quite different. I would say it's mock heroic. I would say it's a mock heroic play. It's sort of it's full of uh, mock heroism, and uh, you know you have a, a deliberately anti-heroic figure like Rosie Redmond, who's a prostitute, uh, who dismisses the fight for freedom. Quote, a freedom that wouldn't be worth winning in a raffle. End quote. She finds it heartbreaking that young fellas are thinking of anything or admiring anything but silk transparent stockings shown off the shape of a little lassie's leg. So that's her kind of you know, dismissive uh, attitude towards uh, revolutionary struggle. Nora Clitheroe, um, another strong woman character who tries to prevent her husband from, from taking part in the rising, she talks about me who risked more for love than they would risk for hate. And that's her attitude that she, she's sort of uh, devoted to. A bit like Leopold Bloom, you know, um, love is, you know, the, the, the opposite to hate is love. So the plough, with its irreverent take on the Easter Rising, caused trouble in the Abbey Theatre, with Maud Gone and Hannah Skeffington, whom, ironically, uh, they led the charge against the plough. And ironically, um, of course, um, uh, Sean O'Casey had, had lionised um, Hannah Shee Skeffington's um, um, uh, husband, a late husband, who was killed during 1916 as... You know the great lost Labour leader, Feather O'Connolly. Uh, uh, Connolly was the was the you know was the lost leader, and that 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 um, that um, uh, Skeffington was the real deal when it came to to um, having the potential to be to be a great leader of of, uh, of Ireland. Now Yeats, of course, jumped to O'Casey's defence, um, and he his artistic hauteur found common ground with O'Casey's acerbic revisionism. So my final point is that O'Casey was. A revisionist was a, one of the first revisionists when it came to Irish history. You could say that he was the first thoroughgoing revisionist. I mean, in Yeats, there is a sort of a, a hint of this. For example, in Easter 1916, where he says, um, Was it a useless death after all, for England may keep faith for all that is done and said? He sort of had this ambivalence. But essentially, Yeats's poem about the Easter Rising is a heroic poem with a sort of a, a tinge of ambivalence uh, built into it. But in O'Casey's case, I think you could say he was a thoroughgoing revisionist when it came to the Irish Revolution. Uh, I mean, the plough makes use of, of a well-known speech by Patrick Pearce uh, in order to, to allow the Covey to say uh, the only war that is worth fighting is the war for economic eman uh, emancipation. And if I'm right that the Covey is a kind of a, of a version of, of um, uh, a character representing the early... Um, O'Casey, okay, then it's an interesting uh, comment by the Covey. Now, two further points I want to make. First of all, it's not surprising really that O'Casey's okay, depiction of the rising caused offence. After all, 
the plough was only, I mean, the plough was performed a decade, just a decade after the events that it depicted, and only a few years after the state came into being. So, in most countries in the world, newly independent countries, the leaderships are very sensitive and and um, uh, not really that uh, keen on criticism, you know, for, for, for good reason. They're trying to stabilise and bed down the state, and in this case, of course, there was a threat of, of insurrection against the state um, from those who had lost the civil war. So, it seems to me that although the plough was opposed, it did not prevent it from running in what was Ireland's national theatre and from being revived repeatedly in the years that followed. It seems to me that it was not surprising that the plough met resistance. It was a good thing that we did have a contrarian view of Ireland's revolutionary period at this early stage, because I think that the contrarian view of O'Casey and of Yates and Sean O'Fuelon later on and Pat O'Donnell and, and uh, others uh, who kind of, if you like, took on the state and tried to act as a corrective to what otherwise could have been somewhat more, um, uh, well, I think that, that um, there was a sort of a, a nationalistic, a monolithic nationalistic view of the world and this is entirely understandable in the early 1920s and indeed into the 30s and 40s. It was a new state and there was a certain kind of, kind of um, orthodoxy which was developed very quickly, very early on. And it seems to me that it was good for us as a nation that we had an alternative view, even if it wasn't listened to or was criticised and was censored in many cases. I think it was good that we had this... Um, this um, contrarian view on the part of a number of, of distinguished writers who, who wrote brilliantly and who didn't accept the, the mainstream view of things and um, in the case of O'Casey challenged the entire ethos uh, that underpinned the revolutionary movement. So how do I therefore assess O'Casey's analysis which is effectively that Connolly took the labour movement and brought it astray and that, that the, this, you know, the citizen army became a sort of, a, a, um, a sort of an underling to the, to the kind of um, Irish volunteers and the IRB view of the world. Well, I would say that um, I would go back to O'Casey's interim thesis in the history of the Irish citizen army where he said that the involvement in Easter week did make a difference. The involvement of the citizen army in Easter week did make a difference. I can recall the 50th anniversary of the Easter Rising that the actual image of Connolly as one of the leaders of the Rising did soften somewhat the, the kind of Gaelic Catholic um, narrative that uh, was the prevailing orthodoxy in the Irish state at that time. And looking back, it seems to me that the one thing, we, one thing we can be very proud of is that Ireland avoided the, the temptations of um, atavistic nationalism in our state. And for example, the seminal event to me in independent Ireland was the handover of power in 1932 from, from the victors in the Civil War to those who had lost. And the peaceful transfer of power uh, and the avoidance of popular right-wing ideologies that took root in continental Europe during the 1930s. I mean, there was a sort of a, a, an, an attempt at a, at a fascist movement in Ireland, but it lasted only a very short time and, and, and ran out of steam very, very quickly. And I think, I, think we can, I think we can sort of attribute that success in avoiding that kind of right-wing um, uber-nationalistic populism to the influence of the, the kind of memory of Connolly and, and others who were on that sort of, um, that side of the equation, if you like, in 1922. And it seems to me that with his three great plays, O'Casey reshaped the drama of history, the drama of Irish history, into a compelling critique of the Irish Revolution which was a good thing that we had it in the early years of independence, it seems to me. Thank you very much.